what does our neuroregulation of appetite, you know, do for us navigating this modern world? And how was that forged in our evolutionary past as hunter-gatherers? So, I mean, there's still a lot of evolutionary biology, ancestral health, but I'm not starting the conversation specifically from that kind of paleo diet perspective. I'm really asking this question, you know, how is our neuroregulation of appetite determined and what's the significance of that now that we live in this modern world of hyper palatable food welcome to corporate warrior the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health optimize performance and maximize productivity with your host lawrence neal This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carson, and trainer Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high-intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, and Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high-intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing and the courses are really easy to follow and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention that there is a DIY course. So this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regimen. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I.com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, that's hituni.com, pick your course, and enter the coupon code CW10. Thank you for your support. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior with your host Lawrence Neal. This podcast was founded by my urge to answer an unlimited number of questions I seem to have and I use this as an opportunity to exercise my obsessive curiosity to understand the specifics and the details and how to optimize productivity in health, career, business and lifestyle. My guests include some of the biggest names in health and fitness through to the niche but nonetheless very knowledgeable high intensity training experts personal trainers new york times best selling authors across all sorts of disciplines highly successful business owners and not so well known startup entrepreneurs life hackers finance gurus and many many more my next guest is the one and only rob wolf for most of you i doubt rob requires an introduction he is a former biochemist New York Times best-selling author of The Paleo Solution. His podcast is one of the top ranked on iTunes. He is review editor for the Journal of Nutrition and Metabolism, a consultant for the Naval Special Warfare Resiliency Program. Wow, that's a mouthful. He serves on the board of directors and advisors for Specialty Health, Paleo FX, and Paleo Magazine. He's basically a massive stud and the most well-known and prolific paleo diet expert on the planet. Did I also mention he's a former powerlifting champion? This was a really fun interview that explores some new topics that I would expect are quite hard to find on the internet and in other interviews Rob has been in. Um, some of the things we talk about include why it's 33 times harder to get into the Navy SEALs than it is the NFL, his latest book, Wired to Eat, the ongoing macro diet wars in terms of calories in, calories out versus high fat, low carb, how ketones might have a slight myostatin inhibition effect, how to eat well on a budget and for nutrition efficiency, what biomarkers you should be tracking and trying to improve for muscle gain, and much, much more. I hope you enjoy this as much as I enjoyed recording it. Please enjoy my podcast with the one and only Rob Wolf. (music) 
Rob, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for taking the time. Really excited to talk to you. Um, I wanted to kick off with asking you this question, which I, I was kind of blown away when I heard it on your interview with um, Paul Burgess on athletic fitness and nutrition. And I couldn't believe you didn't talk about it a bit more. And I was wondering, is it really true that it's 33 times harder to get into the Navy SEALs than it is the NFL? And I assume if that's true, that's based on the ratio of entrance to rejections or something like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a little a little Dr. Google search will pull that up now, but they are so buried by applicants that it, it you know, for each. Now, part of this, too, is there's a lot more NFL players than there are SEALs when, when you kind of get down to it, um, kind of uh, more potential slots. Well, hold on. actually, I don't know if that's true, because there's about. 2,500 active duty SEALs, and then you have reserves. So maybe that's not a true statement, but it, it um, but yeah, the uh, the applicant pool is much much larger. And the fascinating thing is that they are consistently getting uh, graduate degreed individuals, both masters and PhDs, that are entering as enlisted individuals and not going the officer route. So, like the the applicant pool that they are getting is off the Richter, like it, as far as uh, numbers of people, physical and mental characteristics, it, it's just crazy. I wonder why it suddenly spiked so much then in recent years. Is that something to, something to do with um, Hollywood or something like that, do you think? Definitely. You know, like there was the, the whole uh, lone survivor story, Marcus Luttrell. Great um, movie. That was a biggie. You know, there's there's been a lot of, of media that has – push this stuff out and you know the u.s is now in what year like uh 16 15 of of uh this whole extended warfare deal so there's just been a, a lot of media exposure a lot of books a lot of movies some tv shows um there's a reality program now i, I think called the selection where they basically put people you know av- more or less average people through a similar process is what you would go through for like Delta Force or or the uh, Buds Hell Week kind of kind of deal. So there's a, a remarkable amount of interest in the whole thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I I, I think the problem is though is a film like Lone Survivor kind of glorifies. Uh, Navy SEAL experience in a way um, and I actually understand that the true story behind that wasn't quite so um, uh, appealing I mean obviously you know it's not appealing in that uh, you know some very close friends lose their lives but the the true story was was quite horrifying in it because obviously they for the movie they make it um slightly more palatable for people than perhaps it would be um, right yeah i mean even the the book is quite it's significantly different in that regard relative to the movie and then there's some speculation that you know even the the book had some massaging and polish relative to what the real real story was so yeah that's a that that seems pretty reasonable okay so um congratulations on your new book why to eat um which i think is available for pre-order but it doesn't actually come out for purchase for a few weeks yet is that right yeah in the u.s it is releasing march 21st i'm pretty sure the uk release is march 8th actually so it'll be out earlier in the uk excellent um which i have no idea how they did that but they're 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 on the ball they're making it happen we're slick yeah (laughs) yeah yeah um and normally the other way around but that's interesting to hear um so when you were on um athletic fitness and nutrition with paul burgess which is a great interview i really enjoyed that he Thank did a, he did a great job asking you about why to eat um so I, I do think for a more general overview i think i will recommend listeners go and listen to that episode i'll bl- link it in the show notes as well um but for completeness i'm sure you know listeners will be curious to know what why to eat offers and how it differs from the paleo solution so can you just talk a bit about that and perhaps give people a view on the content that the book provides yeah yeah you know the wire deed it really looks at this whole story from the perspective of what does our neuroregulation of appetite 
you know, do for us navigating this modern world? And how was that forged in our evolutionary past as hunter-gatherers? So, I mean, there's still a lot of evolutionary biology, ancestral health, but I'm not starting the conversation specifically from that kind of paleo diet perspective. I'm really asking this question, you know, how is our neuroregulation of appetite determined and what's the significance of that now that we live in this modern world of hyper palatable foods, the ability to order food to our front door, um, sit in our underwear all day and, and work from home, uh, you, you know, heat food up in the microwave. So we have a really remarkable change in the way that we experience the world relative to even, you know, a couple of generations ago, not even going back as far as Paleolithic times. And so I, I really try to make a case that if you were surprised – or let me say it a different way. You shouldn't be surprised that navigating the modern world of hyper palatable foods, addictive social media, et cetera, et cetera, none of that should surprise you that it's difficult to turn it down. Like it is all developed and engineered to play to the evolutionary biology that forged our, our genetics. And it, it's challenging to decouple from that. It's not impossible, but you, it, it, I don't see this as much in Europe and, and the UK, but in the US, and I don't know if it's kind of a, a holdover of some of the kind of puritanical kind of kind of religious stuff or what it is, but um, Americans really love flogging themselves when they, they experience some sense of failure. They love moralizing and making everything about, you know, moral failure and all this type of stuff. And when people get in that mindset, it's almost impossible to move them forward. Whereas if we can explain that like, hey, it's reasonable that you want to eat the whole bag of chips and then the dessert and then the next thing, like that's totally reasonable. It's going to get you into really bad trouble at some point. But, you know, it's it's understandable why this is and this is not a moral failure. And so if we can get people to that point, then we're at least at a, a level starting point to be able to get them moving forward and affecting some change because that that emotional piece is really powerful at um, hamstringing people and they they will be motoring along doing really quite well but then they'll start kind of ruminating they're like well this seems hard and man my buddy did this and it, he just made it look effortless and and then you know there's all this kind of crazy self talk that goes on so the wired to eat is really looking at this from the neuroregulation of appetite um, I provide some triage mechanisms for figuring out where you are on the insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity spectrum. I talk about digestion and gut microbiome. We get in and do a 30-day reset. That's followed up by a seven-day carb test. And what we're able to do with this is go from a very big picture recommendation that's based in this kind of ancestral health scene and then get very, very granular. Because one thing that we definitely understand these days is that from individual to individual, how we react to different foods, different amounts of carbohydrate, sleep loss, all these different things, it's a massive difference from person to person. We really can't... Uh, you can't really abide a one-size-fits-all approach anymore. If you happen to be lucky enough that that one-size-fits-all approach um, perfectly matches your needs, then you're you're lucky and also kind of an exception. And uh, you know, there's there's a lot of individual variation that needs to be accounted for. And I think I do a pretty good job in the book of of doing that. You know, starting simple so that we don't blow people out of the water, but then moving forward and getting very specific and granular as to what their individual needs are. Do you know, aside from, you know, subjective measures that you can use to measure the quality of your sleep, um, and I guess figure out what volume or amount of sleep is optimum for for the individual what like objective measures do you recommend i know people recommend things like heart rate variability tracking but i'd be interested to know what what would be a good some good measures that you recommend people use to to work out how much sleep they really need to perform at their best yeah you know the hrv is is probably one of the best tools and you could couple that there there are some different things like um oh it's not nest that's the thing that controls the heat <laughs> in your house um i forget it, it, you know there's some activity monitors mm -hmm. uh there is actually kind of like a, a sheet that has some uh you know uh, uh piezoelectric uh, threads in it and so it can feel when you roll around and then that communicates with an app and i think if you did something like that where you could look at what your 
heart rate variability score is, and then overlay that with what your actigraphy is, which is basically how much you're kind of flouncing around and rolling around while while theoretically sleeping or at least while in bed, you could get some sense of, oh, man, when my HRV is looking really good, my actigraphy looks a particular way. Um, if I had a couple of cocktails kind of close to bed, my HRV tanked, and interestingly, my actigraphy was was much different. And so you can start piecing some of this stuff together. And and it's a it's a really good question because there are it, there's a just about infinite number of things that people could track. And I actually see a lot of folks get paralyzed by the number of things that they can track. And it, it's really important to make smart selections on that like you want to track what is what is going to be meaningful and that you can do something about and so the hrv and then possibly some sort of an actigraphy tracker would be a great way of really uh, getting your hands around what the optimum amount of sleep is if there's anything that is disturbing your sleep what does it look like going to bed at 9 p.m versus 11 p.m you know like what what how do you how do you feel um, what's the HRV looking like? What's your actigraphy looking like? You, you know, so those are some really easy and expensive ways to get a pretty good handle on that. Do you remember the brand of the sheet or the product product there? I don't. You know, when we wrap this up, I will ping my wife <laughs> and I'll, I'll get it because we literally just installed this thing, and I can't for the life of me remember. I've I've been sent a number of these. These things, you know, like one of them was kind of like a, a skinny board that you slide under you, and that thing was super uncomfortable. And sounds like a chili somebody, pad. It, 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 well, the chili pad is actually pretty pretty comfortable. And you know, if those guys integrated some actigraphy into the chili pad, that would they would business opportunity there, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe I should email those guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool, good stuff, and good advice. Um, so, uh, good good friend of mine and and guest and listener Skylar Tanner, I think you you might know, um, mm-hmm. mentioned to me that you did a twenty four hour glucose monitoring exercise uh, recently. Um, hopefully, you remember the results of that, and I'd be interested to know, you know what your findings were. If there were any surprises. Yeah, and it was actually a a two week test where I wore a continuous blood glucose monitor, a CGM, and you you basically take this thing, slap it onto your arm, and it has kind of a little uh, I I don't think it's Bluetooth, but a little little uplink with a monitor, and once every minute it checks your blood glucose, and so you get a really um, crystal clear picture of where you are. Uh, with regards to your blood glucose. And, you know, I, I have to say there wasn't anything massively surprising, um, but I haven't really done much blood glucose monitoring in the past. Like on a, a very subjective level, I have just noticed, and I've known this for 20 years, I don't do that great with a ton of carbs. Like I have a pretty tight carbohydrate window. I do better when I, I have more physical activity. I do better if I put the carbs in that peri-workout period. But, you know, some things like white rice and white potatoes, they just put my blood glucose to the moon. I mean, it, I, I was in near diabetic levels from a very modest serving of, of right. these foods. And then there were some other things like lentils that I had a really, you know, pretty trivial blood glucose entry, increase. And uh, one thing that was really interesting is for ages, I have felt like I could feel both the weird physical sensations of high blood glucose levels, and I could definitely identify when I was heading into like a post-peak hypoglycemic event. And there's a lot of doctors, a lot of medical and health and fitness professionals that will say, oh, that's BS. You can't tell your blood glucose. And, you know, if you talk to type 1 diabetics, if you talk to people who actually have problems managing their blood glucose, they can tell. They can tell both the upside and the downside But what was cool about that was I I was able to take this subjective experience that I've had for years and then really put some hard numbers to that. So that was really enlightening. Um, I guess one thing that was really fascinating was that, like, if I experienced, say, like a blood glucose of 160, which was really pretty darn high, and then it it would crash back down and it would settle out, say, in the 80s. I felt pretty bad at 80. 
and, but yet I did a couple of days of very low carb and my blood sugar was in the, the low 70s and I felt great, but it had been at that level for a long time. So one thing that I took away from that, and this is something that, that possibly is unique to myself or unique to people in my situation like this, if I have a really profound delta from from a high to a low – that makes me feel really, really bad. And it's pretty well understood in the the literature that uh, neurons, our brain, does not like big swings in blood glucose levels. And I talked to Christopher Kelly from Nurse Balance Thrive yesterday about some of this stuff. And he made the point that he has historically felt like that. But now he's in a spot where uh, he's done some gut microbiome fiddling and some other work. And now even though he may get blood glucose up around 160 and then it'll go back down to more base levels, he doesn't feel as disturbed by that. So it's an it's an interesting thing. Like, is that inability to deal with that delta? Is that a diagnostic criteria? Like, is that give, providing some information? And that's some stuff that I'm now fiddling with. But definitely for me and where I'm at currently, um, it provided some pretty good insight that, you know, somewhere between 75 and 150 grams of carbs a day, more on hard training days, more in the peri workout period. Um, I felt better and my blood glucose um, numbers were much, much better. You mentioned the lentils didn't have such an impact. And I appreciate this is a very individualistic type of um, experiment. Is, would that have something to do with the fiber content, do you think? I mean, it, it could. It, it, it almost certainly does. You know, yes, it almost certainly. It, it has significant amounts of fiber. It has significant amounts of protein. Um, to get 50 grams of effective carbohydrate from lentils is a big meal, whereas 50 grams of carbohydrate from rice is a pretty trivial meal. Like, it's really not that much. But it's interesting. I had some other friends, Eva Twardokins, Michael Rutherford. They did this same experiment. And also, there, there was some really great research that came out of Israel that looked at exactly this process. And it was actually the company that is licensing this technology out of Israel that I worked with in, in doing this uh, CGM experiment. But you have other people that will do the white rice and the white potatoes, and they get a barely perceptible blood glucose increase. But yet the lentils spike them. And what was interesting with me is that when I did black beans and pinto beans, I had quite high blood glucose response from, from those items. And those things usually give me acid reflux, too. So there's something wacky going on there. And so, yeah, you know, the, the fiber and the protein content – almost certainly are a factor there. But the thing that is interesting is this is not uniform across the whole population. Now, we, we could probably say maybe like two-thirds of people are going to have a typical predictive response in that the, uh, the complexity of the carbohydrate, the presence of the fiber, the presence of the protein is all going to modify and slow that blood glucose response. But some of what happens in this that people forget – is that the blood glucose can go up irrespective of uh, uh, carbohydrate content in the meal. Um, a stress response can release uh, catecholamines, you know, uh, adrenaline and cortisol, mm. and then that can elevate blood glucose. And I think that that's some of what's going on here. If people have food sensitivities, then you're actually seeing an elevated blood glucose response, and it really has nothing to do specifically with the carbohydrate content, but is actually an immunogenic response. That's really interesting. So it's, it's much more multifactorial than perhaps people think. It really is. And I mean, it, it, it's, it's cool on the one hand and it's maddening on the other <laughs> when you, if you're working as someone that's just trying to help people navigate, like what the hell do you eat to be basically healthy? You know, it, it, I, I was so 10 years ago, I was so confident about what you should and shouldn't do. And I guess this is the whole Dunning Kruger deal, you know, where you it, at the beginning of this graph, you, you feel like you know it all and really you know nothing. And <laughs> the further I've gone along, I feel like the dumber I get <laughs> on this stuff. But if I've taken anything away from it, it's that we do have some good general starting points, you know, whole unprocessed food, um, be, be mindful of the carbohydrate content, be mindful of the immunogenic uh, potential of different foods. And that's 
for me, about as on, on specifically the food side of things, that's about as as uh, you know, writ in stone as I could really get. And then from there, it's a lot of details and nuance. And even those details and nuance can, it, it's not just potentially different from person to person, but you individually, um, that story can change. Like we see this a lot with police, military, and firefighters where if they're not deployed or if they're on a day shift kind of schedule, their carbohydrate tolerance is, is much better than during a stressful uh, night shift like altered circadian rhythm deployment or like a, a swing shift or something like that. So this can really change even for an individual based off of what type of outside stressors or those epigenetic inputs that, that are affecting this. This is this is quite a good um, segue into, I guess, the whole high-carb, low-fat, high Fat, low carb, always get that mixed up. Um, debate that is ongoing. Um, you know, I, I invested a lot of my identity in low carb, high fat. Um, I gave a lot of advice. I helped a fair amount of people lose body fat doing that. And I was so invested in it that I, I perhaps became a little bit um, closed minded about it. And before interviewing Gary Torbs, uh, I was absolutely inundated with counter arguments from my listeners uh, and friends who were far more um, but believers uh, have become believers of the kind of uh, energy balance calories in calories out argument over and above the low carbohydrate and it really caused it really challenged my own beliefs and I had tons of literature thrown at me which I still haven't been able to digest <laughs> um, but I, I suppose you've answered it already in a way but I I'm fascinated by this debate and and I just want to know what, what is your position on this ongoing debate? Do you, you know, because a lot of these people that came at me were so they 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 almost they were they were quite um they almost felt that Gary Torbs was was being um immoral in his judgment and in his guidance, and I don't think that was fair at all. Um, I felt like the arguments were quite sort of straw man in a way, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, I. I, but but that being said, I'm you know they showed that there was some literature that was sorry this is a very drawn out question but there was some literature that was shared with me which showed that the uh, you know across a sample of people that the response the insulin response to protein and carbohydrate didn't change or was negligible um, and I just wondered what your view is on that you know what I, st I hear you for the most part still advocating a low carb diet for the majority so. Is that is that? Do you still believe that that is for the majority that uh, carbohydrates will elevate insulin more than any other macronutrient, and therefore we should all for the for the majority of people, you know, a low carb diet is going to favour them? Oh man, that is a really good question. I <laughs> hope I can do justice on it because if I get it right, like I, it, it might actually be somewhat helpful and could be worth people listening to this thing. Um, <laughs> you know, if if we put people in a metabolic ward and we starve them, and a metabolic ward is basically a hospital setting that is just a step above prison. Like you don't get the shower perks, you do get some food, and you know all the rest of that stuff. And if we stick people in a situation like that where they have no access to go choose what they are going to eat, they will lose fat and body weight on just about any type of a hypocaloric scenario. And this is what the stuff, you know, like the um, if it fits your macros crowd and the, the really diehard um, uh, uh, calories in, calories out folks, like they, they will cite this stuff and it's accurate. Like it, it is completely accurate. If you um, hold a gun to someone's head and and force them to eat in a particular way, then they are going to lose body fat and, and lean out and improve, improve uh, metabolic profiles under just about any type of approach that they use. But the thing that these people just seem uh, uh, wantonly ignoring is that none of us live in a metabolic ward except people that are actually in prison. You know, we live in an environment where if you just go into a, a average convenience store, you have thousands of different food and flavor options, which all of these things individually are so hyper palatable. They're engineered to bypass the neuroregulation of appetite, and then if you're able to stack one food after another after another, you can easily bypass the neuroregulation of appetite and eat far more total calories than what you would have otherwise consumed. And 
the hormones end up mattering in that story. The calories end up mattering in that story. But what everybody is missing is just this fundamental neurological wiring that governs the neuroregulation of appetite. And if you're able to to look at that, and you also look a little bit at where are folks on this insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance spectrum. There's some pretty good data that suggests that people who are overweight but insulin sensitive – which there aren't that many people, but they are out there, those people tend to do better on this kind of classic fitness bodybuilder, uh, moderate to high protein, moderate, you know, maybe even highish carb, low fat approach. It, you know, they, they seem to consistently feel better and lose body fat, and, and they do quite well on that. But the vast majority of westernized people who are overweight or, or just uh, uh, dyslipidemic metabolic syndrome, they are insulin resistant. And the, it, without a doubt, it is easier to get those people to lose body fat and to comply with the dietary intervention if they are on a lower carb approach. And again, all of this stuff tends to circle back into the neuroregulation of appetite. And so you have these camps that are just really uh, spiteful and cranky and angry. And, you, you know, the the calories in, calories out people I'm I'm frustrated by in that I don't I don't see any of these people moving the needle on things like autoimmune disease or neurodegenerative disease, whereas the low carb and the kind of paleo autoimmune paleo camp, they're saving a lot of lives. And these other people seem to mainly be concerned with fitness professionals and bodybuilders. And although they may they may help the average person to some degree, like I don't really see them contributing much, if anything, to the bigger conversation. And uh, so I see both of these stories as having merit. I see almost all of these people ignoring the fundamental genetic wiring that that underlies our, our tendency to overeat. There's this process, uh, a, a concept called optimum foraging strategy, which all organisms live or die by in the natural world. And it, it basically boils down to... You need to obtain more calories and nutrients out of your environment than what you spend obtaining it. And you, you know, and it's a basic economic kind of, kind of uh, story. And when you think about that and you think about our modern world that provides infinite access to calories with virtually no expenditure in, in, uh, you know, energetic output. On the one hand, you could say that we've really maxed out optimum foraging strategy and we're winning like we never have in history, but it's now to such a degree that it's causing these secondary effects, which are basically the modern Western degenerative diseases. And, uh, you know, for me, it's, it, uh, it, you know, if you trying to convince somebody to change their religion is is tough because you need to die to figure out who's right and who's wrong. And if you happen to be an atheist, then you don't really know anyway because <laughs> you know nothing happens. But with dietary interventions, I'm really kind of flummoxed that we can't just say, okay, let's do low-carb, high-fat for 30 days and see how you look, feel, and perform. Let's see what your blood lipids look like. And then let's do high-carb, low-fat and do that for 30 to 60 days and see how you look, feel, and perform and check blood lipids, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a, akin to just trying on a sweater or trying on a pair of jeans and being very clinical in this application instead of uh, trying to drive the whole boat from this um, you know, theoretical framework. And, and just one final dig in this whole thing. A ton of the people that really, really, really buy into this calories in, calories out kind of deal – they're asking for these really complex randomized controlled trials that emphatically prove or disprove this, that, and the other. But these same people tend to be strength and conditioning coaches. If you ask these people, hey, have you ever gotten somebody a 300-pound bench press? It's like, yeah, for sure. It's like, did you visit any scientific training to get them there? And they will generally say yes. And it's like, okay, show me the randomized control trial that gets a person to a 300-pound bench doesn't exist there's concepts you know like maybe you need to one individual needs to increase cross-sectional diameter you need a hypertrophy process some people need to really optimize the the neural efficiency and the rate coding of their their pressing movement or what have you but we have general concepts there but a lot of these folks do a really wacky logical fallacy process where they they create a barrier um 
when discussing this topic that is so robust in supporting their uh, pet theory, but yet the things that they do day to day don't even live up to the standards that they're trying to impose on someone else. And that that makes me pretty much want to curb stomp and dismiss those folks. But I do my best to still engage and go beyond. And I, hopefully I, I address that uh, really, really good question in a, at least a half-assed way. Longest question in podcast history, probably. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> definitely not a question I'm sure you would have asked, uh, Rob. You would have shortened it, uh, no doubt. Um I yeah I, I mean I want to I actually want to ask you who are you talking about precisely but I know that would be incredibly unfair for me to ask you that question um, but I, I completely agree and I wish we could all just um, be unbiased and 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 kind of embrace the uh, spirit of you know always learning and improving um, and and I also think this made me. Uh, it's motivated me to get far more into the whole quantified self side of things and uh, start doing a lot more n equals one and on myself and just figuring out you know what let's figure out what works for me and you know i've done low carb high fat um combined with high intensity strength training for 30 days um and i've always i think it's eight weeks and i i lost fat and gained muscle at the same time so (laughs) you know um i think there's a lot of value in those types of experiments um yeah you know it, it, it Again, this is N equal one stuff and people dismiss it and it's like, oh, you know, a million anecdote does not one shred of evidence make. But, you know, I just it's easier for me living my day to day life to remain lean and pretty, pretty athletic and healthy and have good blood lipids. If I just eat on the lower carb side of things like I'm just not as hungry, I don't have the blood sugar swings, I uh, my digestion's better. And so do I just dismiss that? Like, you know, at, at some point, there isn't a randomized control trial that demonstrates that dropping a, f- a hammer on your foot produces pain. But at some point, also, you don't need a goddamn randomized control trial to do everything in your life. Like, at, at some point, experience does have some some value. There was a time before medicine became so litigious and so focused on trying to document everything um, for the for the sake of avoiding being sued that doctors went off their gut and and there's some argument that they probably did a better job then than uh, you know now everybody needs to fit into a very specific diagnostic criteria so that the insurance pays for what's going on and this has kind of trickled over into the rest of life like the the kind of skeptic scene is really hilarious in a way because uh, again they in the pet areas where they want to decry a particular topic, they create a, a, a series of standards that most of their life wouldn't even live up to. Most of the ways that they make their day-to-day decisions don't live up to the standards that they're creating for these these people that they're basically engaging with. Good stuff. Um, so a question from a... <laughs> No, it's good. It's good. It's a uh, you know, it's all good stuff. Um, the so a, a, another guest had on a podcast, uh, a chap by the name of uh, Jay Vincent. Um, has got a great question. I'd love to hear your input on. Um, he said he read that uh, ketones have a slight myostatin inhibiting effect, and this would highly benefit muscle growth if it's true and go against the grain towards the common bodybuilding belief that carbohydrates are necessary for growing large muscles. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, man, it's really good. You know, so, you know, we've been so focused looking at the in these macronutrient wars, um, looking at ourselves as basically kind of a bomb calorimeter, like you put nutrients in they get burned. If there's an excess, then you have the ability to, you know, like build muscle or accrete fat and whatnot. And we really are just scratching the surface of understanding that protein, carbs, fat. Uh, ketone bodies, individual amino acids, um, a host of other uh, food-derived substances, they're signaling molecules. And these signaling molecules have really profound knock-on effects. And there are a number of folks, um, uh, I, I think Ryan Lowry, some of these other people that are doing some some really good research, and they look at folks doing ketogenic diets with resistance training they've got good controls and you see some some nutrient partitioning that that seems to go above and beyond what you would just get from the the basic caloric story and the, i i don't know if folks are aware of this but there's been some 
I don't know, maybe 10 years, some indication that exercise increases BDNF, but uh, uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which helps to grow more new neurons in the brain and, and enhance connections. And they didn't know what the mechanism was of that for ages, but about two years ago, a paper came out and it indicated that it's ketone bodies that release BDNF. And, and so you don't need to necessarily be in a ketogenic state to produce ketones. You just need to exercise very hard. And even a, a high-carb athlete who's, who's training at very high output is going to produce ketone bodies. But the ketone bodies in that situation are the signaling molecule that causes the cascade to release BDNF. Is this because, so, sorry to interrupt, Rob, is that because yeah. you're, when you say exercise intensity, you're emptying glycogen stores? Is that what triggers the release of body fat for ketones? Is that, is that the mechanism you're describing? The, no, when, you know, when we're really pushing the outer edge of performance, mm. The body is just trying to get uh, uh, fuel from anywhere that it can. And so as the person is ramping up now, they, they may be burning uh, primarily glucose as, you know, glycogen as their, their primary fuel source, particularly in these these uh, glycolytic anaerobic activities. But they're also mobilizing fat to the best of their ability, and so you've got increased free fatty acid mobilization, and some of that is getting converted into ketone bodies as well. Like it's basically, you know, we're going to throw everything we can at this process to try to get as much energy output as possible. That's really funny because in my head and my simplistic brain, I think of like, you know, an, a, a, an order of things. <laughs> So you're you're almost saying that all happens in tandem, or it can. Yeah, um, and I mean, even it, that's kind of, it, a really important thing for people to remember. At rest, all of those metabolic pathways are occurring to some degree. Hmm. So we're you know mobilizing and utilizing glucose to some degree. There is some degree of ketone body formation, and we're uh, you know dealing with fatty acid uh, uh, degradation. We've got protein turnover. You know, we we've got the urea cycle and everything. All of that stuff happens more or less all the time and there's equilibrium balances where you push things to one side versus the other but it really is going on all the time but then different degrees of physical activity will kind of goose things in in a particular direction but it, it, it's really appealing to try to stick these things into buckets and say oh when we're at aerobic pace it's only fat mobilization and clearly there's there's huge spectrums on this stuff like an individual that eats a ketogenic diet and becomes more fat adapted if they're at a relatively low exercise output they're going to burn much more fat and and produce potentially more ketone bodies during that process than than an individual that's a, a higher carb uh consumer but you know it's um it it's all going on at the same time yeah but but, but again back to your, your original question the um you know the uh, the ketone bodies are clearly important signaling molecules. Uh, I have read about the potential myostatin inhibiting effects. There there is some interesting stuff there, and this is where for me it starts getting really really complex. Um, insulin is is clearly you know quote an anabolic hormone, but some of what may be happening there is that individuals that can really handle a high carb diet tend to have elevated thyroid output. The elevated thyroid output tends to enhance testosterone production and more importantly, testosterone expression. Thyroid facilitates the, the interaction of the testosterone molecule with the testosterone receptor. And so you have these people who eat, you know, super high carb diets and they're really lean and they're super jacked and you hate these people, but they've just to some degree kind of pulled the genetic lottery in the way that they are able to process this whole thing. And then you have someone like me who's a doughy Northern European guy if they eat a lot of carbs. But then if, you know, there may be some other mechanisms towards success, which may rely more on myostatin inhibition. Um, you know, the interesting thing, though, about lower carb diets in general is that we have an increase in sex hormone binding globulin, which tends to decrease free testosterone. So where's the net win there? You know, I mean, it, it just gets really, really complex. And that that's where uh, 
understanding the mechanisms are really valuable, but you, in my opinion, you cannot manage the complexity with the dueling banjo of complexity. You have to find a simple approach, experiment, uh, have a good starting point, have an endpoint of evaluation, and then you know assess appropriately from there. I suppose the layman is kind of slicing the ham rather thin at that point, aren't they? Um, yes. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, you're it, getting out in the weeds with that stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's A lot of my listeners love all that, so it's good to get into some of that. Um, I have a question from a very frugal listener, uh, and he wanted to understand, what would you tell the poorest people in the world to eat? In other words, what is the cheapest or what are the cheapest foods that have the best nutritional density? in your view hmm um man that's uh i mean again even um oh man you so most starvation and scarcity today is 100 percent an outgrowth of political climate not a lack of food not a lack of resources like people who starve today starve because the people in control of their uh Political systems and distribution systems are bastards, and they're basically bringing that about. Uh, Venezuela is a fantastic example of that. Um, You know, people pretty instinctually tend to seek out at least calorically dense and, uh, uh, you know, historically it's been nutrient-dense foods, but now we tend to focus more on calorically dense foods, particularly if they're hyper-palatable. I mean, animal products are always the win there. There's just no two ways about it. Uh, So to the degree, you know, by hook or by crook, whether people can get, uh, you know, uh, animal sources, fish sources, um, insects are actually incredibly nutrient dense and pretty ubiquitous, and lots and lots of most cultures, other than the bulk of uh, you know uh, European and, and U.S. culture, eat a lot of insects. So that that's maybe uh, oh okay, I'll go with insects. We'll just say insects. Uh, uh, how about that? But you know, it's um it's an interesting question, but it's also those things are kind of frustrating to me because. Um, I'm I'm a bit of a hack at economics and really like decentralized systems and and uh, um, yeah I'll just leave it at that before we we're down to like two people. To this. <laughs> yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. So don't don't yeah. worry, I feel feel a similar uh, way to you on that. Um, same same uh, sort of thread, but uh, slightly different, and hopefully won't take you down that rabbit hole. <laughs> is um, what would be your advice for a pack lunch that you could have every day that uh, you could make very quickly, so let's say sub 10 minutes, but that would give you energy for three to four hours? Um, uh, so this is quite obvious for someone like you or me, um, but my get, my uh, the friend of mine who asked this question, he's a, a, I know why he's asked this, it's because he's, he's what he is a super life hacker he's co-founded a business and he wants to know, how can I fuel myself in the most efficient way possible? Um so yeah, what's, Shoot, your, what's your view just, on that? You know, just get a uh, a feeding tube put in, and then you can just <laughs> you know walk around and just like squeeze a bag, and it'll it'll push nutrients into your gut, and you don't have to chew or swallow. And then you can get a colostomy bag and just shit into the bag, and you don't even have to take the time to wipe or poo or Beautiful. do anything. So that's possibly the the most maximized deal there. Um, I mean, there's I guess there's a couple of ways to slice that up. Uh, you prep food ahead of time. Have that, you know, maybe on the weekend you cook some, you know, lunch for the week and it's all the same thing. Or maybe it's like two different things and you partition it out and either freeze it or put it in the refrigerator and it's all ready to go. Um, I'm really hard pressed to improve upon a bag of jerky or biltong and a bunch of nuts and a couple of apples like that. I, I'm looking at the shelf in my office right now and I have like 18 bags of biltong. I have five apples. I have a, a two kilo thing of pecans and almonds. And so if I didn't, it, but I would generally prefer having like a home cooked meal that either I cook that morning or, uh, uh, you know, cook the night before and then stored it. But short of that, that's a, a not bad meal that is effectively zero preparation time. I mean, other than I needed to shop and purchase this stuff, but then I rip it open and go to town. But you have a choice between bulk meal preparation having that squared away and prepared or you have the option of uh 
you know, doing something like the the jerky nuts and and fruit. And when you say apples, I'm assuming these are organic or they're grown in your own garden on your land. There is that. Uh, I, we <laughs> tend to buy organic, but you know, it's it's. Um, I I think that. So for me, the organic piece, the grass-fed piece, is really with an eye towards sustainability. Um, from the uh, the additional potential health benefits, I don't think are really all that compelling. Particularly if you think about some simple things like, do you drive a car? Um, if you drive a car, the likelihood of you dying due to driving that car is so much greater than the, the delta between an organic and a conventional apple somehow poisoning you due to pesticides. It, it's kind of ridiculous to even contemplate. So I'm really a big advocate of sustainability practices, which include organic and particularly grass-fed uh, pastured meat sources. And, and there are compelling health benefits to that, particularly for the, the, the environment and our gut microbiome and whatnot. But, um, you know, maybe circling back to that, that cost story, you have a college student who's trying to figure out, okay, I can buy one organic apple or 10 conventional apples. I'd probably go for the 10 conventional apples and, and, uh, and then take the bus instead of driving because the bus is less likely to get you killed. <laughs> moving on to uh as a quick question i had on supplementation as i said earlier i've become very interested in uh quantified self and sort of measuring my own performance and, and, and making changes and then measuring again um so i've been looking at optimizing some of my own biomarkers i think that's the best word for this um to optimize my uh muscle gain during a a new strength training protocol that i'm doing so i've been looking at optimizing my vitamin d uh, making sure that's at the best you know the optimal level uh, improving my omega-3 omega-6 ratio um what else do you think is really important in terms of what metrics i should be tracking for optimizing health and muscle gain oh man you know chris masterjohn is has had a number of series on this basically mm -hmm. looking at what do you need to optimize for your nutrient status and he started off with iron and i think that this is particularly important for men um in that i think particularly a lot of men particularly in, in this uh paleo ancestral health scene they may be running a little bit high in iron because of uh you know we're we're kind of designed with an expectation of parasitic in infestation which is going to decrease iron load injuries which are going to transiently decrease iron load so i think that there's a pretty good argument for getting in and really unpacking where you are with with the iron status and then you have copper and selenium and some of these other products that is definitely a goldilocks story you don't want too much you don't want too little and uh i wouldn't even dare to try to improve on what chris has been doing with that stuff like i would really encourage folks to follow that series because he's just gone so deep on these things but really in a super accessible way but he's looked at these fundamental nutrients and, and maybe to the point about the vitamin D, it's really, really important. As important as vitamin D is, vitamin D exists in the body and works in synergy with vitamins K2 and vitamin A as well. And there's really important reasons to make sure that you, you have a balance of all these things. And uh, he has waxed eloquent on that stuff. And I, I couldn't even hold a candle to what he's he's done in that regard. But I would follow Chris Masterjohn's series where he's talking about these specific nutrients. But, you know, with the with regards to the iron, if you were in even a mild state of excessive iron overload, then you will be in a pro-inflammatory state. And if you are inflamed, then you have less ability to respond favorably to training because you're dealing with these other inflammatory processes. You've, you've only got a limited recovery capacity to really deal with that stuff, and you would like to put it towards uh, muscle gain and athletic recovery and not just dealing with systemic inflammation from uh, pro-oxidative stress due to excessive iron. This is fascinating because I have a... Um a calendar event that i keep pushing off to the next day which is give blood <laughs> um, because mm -hmm. it's the most inconvenient mm -hmm. thing ever um so along those lines if you're you know if your iron is is perhaps too high is that a good 
intervention? Is that something that, that you is, advocate? That is the yeah, that's the intervention. Either that or get in a bar fight and just get the tar beat <laughs> out of you and you bleed a good bit. But it, the the uh, donation is is probably preferable. But you know, Chris, uh, I, so man, back in two thousand two thousand one. Dr. Mike Eads, who wrote the really phenomenal book, Protein Power and Protein Power Life Plan, he and his wife recommended that most pe- most men and then postmenopausal women um, just about guaranteed should donate blood because of this iron overload issue. So they were one of the first people that really put this stuff on the map, and it's really compelling, and it's very spot on, and it just got lost for the most part, you know, like uh, – you know, it's just not that sexy to go donate blood. And, you know, you have to deal with a needle. So there's some some issues around that. But it's it's pretty well understood in folks that think about this, that that's a huge benefit. And what Chris Masterjohn noticed is that he was – the lab that he was working in, they used his plasma as well as other people that worked in the, the lab. They used their blood as standards when they were running diagnostic um Tests, you know, basically their their GCMS and HPLC and stuff like that. So they would use their own blood as as standards. And what he noticed is that at the days that he donated a significant amount of blood for to be used as a standard, he immediately felt better, and he felt better for several days afterwards. And then he started, you know, getting the foggy headedness and the kind of joint inflammation and stuff like that. And he observed this, but he was in the middle of grad school, and so he just kind of filed away, and it wasn't until much later that he revisited that story, started donating blood every eight weeks, and was like, oh, man, some of my insulin resistance is because I was inflamed, and that inflammation was a stress, and that stress you know, inhibits insulin sensitivity, and that makes you less carb tolerant, and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I mean, that is a... Um, and in his podcast that, that goes into this, he talks about iron saturation, ferritin, uh, hematocrit, and he kind of gives you some numbers to to look at if you want to do the diagnostic side of that. But I, I think that it's probably a reasonably safe bet that mo- most males, again, um, would probably benefit from donating at least a couple of times a year, if not more on that, that like every eight week schedule. Now, I may be nitpicking here, um, but is there a um, optimal time for doing it? For instance, if you did a high intensity workout, you, know, you, 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 you exercise, say, muscular failure, would you advise giving blood the day after or not? Or does it really matter? Or should I wouldn't want? advise donating the blood the day before that activity, <laughs> for sure. Um, like you will notice a little a little starch taken out of your britches after that until the uh, erythropoietin ramps up your your red blood cell count and all that sort of stuff. So you would you I, I do some old guy Brazilian jiu jitsu and when I donate blood I tend to be kind of mellow the next maybe three days. If I go to JITS, I really pick specific partners. I'm like, hey, I just donated blood. I'm feeling kind of flat. We're going to drill. We're not going crazy. And so I really rain stuff in at that time. That is not the day that I'm rolling with the like 240-pound uh, white belt cop who, who you know is trying to tear everybody's head off. I did not think we were going to talk about this. This is really interesting. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm conscious that uh, the clock is ticking. Have you got a hard stop at half past? Uh, no, I could probably go 10, 10 more minutes. Okay, cool. Good to know. Just a few other questions I wanted to cover. Yeah. Um, so obviously a, a large number of my listeners are um, big advocates of high intensity strength training. So if you're familiar with, uh, Arthur Jones and body by science and Doug and his stuff, um, so a, quite a large number of my listeners will, um, they will work out, you know, once or twice a week, full body, one set to failure. Um, and I'm really interested to know what your thoughts are about this training modality in terms of its effectiveness toward hypertrophy and improving overall health. You know, what are your thoughts on that and have you practiced it yourself in the past? Yeah, you know, I've fiddled with all kinds of stuff like that. And I think if we look at a minimum effective dose and the perspective of ROI return on investment. Um, I think things like, uh, you know, like body by science and the, the, uh, you know, the old Mike Menser stuff, it's really hard to beat that. Like, you know, you just jam in 
you get warmed up and then you you really crank crank out you know kind of one set but th- there's some interesting stuff with that where people start splitting hairs They're like oh they do warm-up sets so it's not really one set you know all this type of type of jive and the usual internet bickering but i think that there's some really um how do i want to say this so when we start graphing out return on investment with this stuff i think that when you're a beginner, you know, clearly you get those easy beginner gains. Um, I think that the more advanced an athlete gets, both with regards to size and strength, then they need to invest more time, more energy, more sets. This is where, you know, if you really want to become an elite strength athlete, the multi-set program is is the way it's going to work. Like you, you can't become a world caliber Olympic weightlifter with a, a one set to failure deal. It's just not going to happen. I would say the same with powerlifters. And there's an empirical piece to that, which is that you just don't see people at the top levels of competition um, winning in in you know using anything other than a a multi-set approach. But you can get quite strong with a a uh, you know a very minimalist program. Um, you maybe aren't world champion powerlifter strong, but like you might be able to get eighty percent of your genetic potential, maybe eighty five. I don't know. You know, I don't want to get super hung up on specific uh, percentages, but you can get really damn strong, especially compared to what your baseline was, with a remarkable paucity of training. But then if you want to get that next 10 percent and then the next 5 percent and then the next 2 percent, the training, the periodization, the planning, the the, uh, modalities all start becoming really, really important. And so, again, it, it really, you know, as to whether or not you should use a methodology like this, you really have to ask who are you and what are you trying to do Um, for for myself? You just use myself as an example. (coughs) Excuse me. Um doing brazilian jiu-jitsu like i have a strength background too i was a former teenage california state powerlifting champion i I was getting close to a 600 pound squat and deadlift at 181 pounds um i'm wired up pretty well that way so you could make an argument that i'm in more of a maintenance mode like i'm not trying to you know build foundational strength and whatnot but I will go into the gym and I've got a, a two day a week program where I do uh, one day of vertical press, vertical pull, and then either a hip or quad dominant movement. And I basically do a light set and then a little heavier set. And then I get in and do a hard work set. And I, and I do this in a circuit fashion, not like a CrossFit circuit fashion where I'm trying to vomit, but you know, I just, I'm not taking time really between sets. I go from thing to thing. And, um, And once I hit that work weight, I'll do between three and five sets of that. Now, this is really quite a bit different than the one set to failure deal. But this whole training session takes me 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the outside. So it's very brief. Um, The one thing that I do for me, I notice that if I start grinding, like if the weight gets heavy enough that it slows down, that's when I personally start feeling some overtraining type of symptomology. So all of my movements have to be fast. It can be relatively heavy, but I've got to be able to do the uh, concentric portion of the movement in less than a second. If it takes longer than a second, it's too grindy. It's too heavy. And uh, for me, I, you know, like I, um, uh, at 170, 175 pounds, like I rarely encounter someone that's remotely as strong as I am on the mat. They may be more technical, but you know, I, I, from that strength side, I, I have way more than enough to be able to, to um, deal with what I need for, you know, for the specific sport. Do you think there's a large genetic component in there as there always is? Um, even from your point yeah, of view, almost certainly. Yeah. You know and I mean? You're talking about fiber type, you're talking about um, hormonal response, you're talking about nervous system, you know, consideration. So, you know, almost certainly you've got folks that um, for a variety of reasons may do better on higher versus lower volume. So, uh, no, great, great answer. Very interesting. Um, As I was saying before we started recording, you're probably the most organized podcast guest I've ever had on. (laughs) You sent me this awesome list of um, stuff to help prepare the podcast, um, pictures and all sorts of things. And you you use the uh, Calendarly, is it? Or I think that's the Yeah, Calendarly, yeah. Calendarly, yeah. yeah, Rich, I use Schedule Ones, uh, very similar. Didn't realize there were 
alternatives to be honest with you but um yeah really really helpful stuff um with that in mind i just wondered if you'd be able to share because obviously you, you, rob you know you've built such an incredibly successful business uh, for your work and i'd be interested to hear what are your core productivity principles be it pareto law or whatever parkinson's law that you uh, have kind of implemented in your work and business that help you get more done that you think most entrepreneurs largely overlook Mm. Well, it took me a long time, but I, I really figured out that the early part of the day is when I'm most creative and productive. And so um, it, and it's kind of tough because I have a family. I have two daughters, but I get up probably 530 and I wake up without an alarm because I tend to go to bed early. But our girls wake up early. So, you know, there's this whole feed forward deal with that. But um, I shower, grab all my gear. I've got all my stuff packed. You, you know, I pack it the night before. And I'm out the door and I try to get as much done as I can before 10 or 11 a.m., which is when I start kind of getting kind of a cognitive slump. And in that morning time, I try to avoid like the plague, the the um, agricultural repetitive work of of modern kind of Internet business stuff. I don't do email I don't do social media. Um, That stuff, I could be on a ventilator and life support and generally pull it off. But like if I want to do a great, you know, like content generation and creative work and stuff like that, then I protect that morning time at gunpoint. And uh, so and I know lots of people like there are people that seem to hit their their creative stride in the evening, which for me is kind of challenging because they're usually messing with their circadian rhythm as well. But I think really recognizing that, um, you know, try to identify when your best creativity period is and do the creative, important work during that time. And then the the iceberg lettuce filler material that you just have to deal with the rest of your life, and that's email and social media and all that, that's when, you know, it, for me, that's the, the afternoon and evening. Um, we put the girls down to bed, and then I'll pull out the, the laptop or my, my iPhone, put on my Schwanny blue blockers, dim the lights, and I'll do an hour of that, um, you know, between, say, like, 5 and 7 p.m. and then I'm done. And so I do my low cognitive demanding stuff, low creativity necessitating stuff in the evening when I'm kind of smoked and I'm on autopilot. And it, so when if anybody emails me, then they'll recognize that I'm basically a zombie when they're they're interacting with me at that point. And then I do my really highly creative stuff in the morning. What does the first 90 minutes of your day look like at the moment? Mm, it's a little variable again because we have young girls and so did somebody poop their pants and the poop went all the way up to the nape of their neck and now i've got to like carry them at arm's length into the shower and clean them you know so i mean there's little it's funny when i hear tim ferris ask these folks about that inevitably when there's like this super detailed oh i do this and i do this and i do this and i look and i'm like Oh, they either don't have kids or their kids are like out of the house or something, you know. So it, it, there's that caveat. But in general, I get up, go do uh, 32 ounces of water um, because we live in the high desert. And so you just need to stay reasonably well hydrated around here. Um, I'll usually flip on the espresso machine, pack up my espresso shot, go hop in the shower, get out of the shower, do the quick shot of espresso. And then I usually actually go to a coffee shop down the street. I have an office outside of the house, but um, sitting in an office alone all day um, will make me crazy. And so I'll go to the coffee shop and get some coffee there, chat with some of the folks there, just get a little social interaction. And then I I work on some of my creative stuff. And then I, I go to the office after that so that I can really hunker in and do my writing or research or something like that. And that's probably the first maybe two hours of the day. Good stuff. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I just got one more question I wanted to ask you. There's a bunch here, but I'm, I'm being really picky because I appreciate uh, running out of time. Um, what's the, the best investment of time, energy, and money you have ever made? Hmm. Oh, sorry. Time, energy, or money. You know, one of, one of the resources. Are... Hmm. Man, that's a really good question. I stole it from someone else, so I can't take full credit. Um, man, those are so different in some ways, but, uh, 
You know what? It, so it, actually, I'll, I'll, I, I do have, a, I think, potentially a decent answer with this. So when we were running our gym, we, my wife and I, I, I cashed out of biotech, which you never make a ton of money as a bench level scientist. But I mean, it, it wasn't bad. And uh, uh, we opened this gym, which was the fourth CrossFit affiliate in the world at, at the time. And we had no idea what we were doing. CrossFit was brand new. People didn't know what it was. In the first two years we opened the gym, we lived off of less than $10,000 a year between the two of us because we were knuckleheads and had no idea how to run this thing. And we were just fortunate that we didn't have kids or a house payment. We lived in a 400-square-foot apartment that uh, should have probably been condemned. But right during this time was during the real estate and economic boom in Northern California. And we had clients that would come into the gym, and God bless them because they were paying us to, to come in the gym and do personal training, and it's part of what kept us alive. But we saw these people going on wine country visits and spending $20,000 a weekend, and they had the best car and a mega house and all this stuff. And then a lot of these people, when the when the scene – not this wasn't even collapse yet. This was just a slower rate of growth. They started failing because they were so leveraged and so overextended that they needed to have like exponential growth in what they were doing to be able to, to, to stay aloft. And just a slower rate of growth, they were starting to get into financial hardship. And then when the real bottom fell out of this whole thing, you saw people lose everything. And I was looking at them. And again, I'm kind of a student of economics. And I, I knew that a bubble was brewing. I thought it was going to pop years earlier than what it did. But it was... Um, what I learned from that, so I drive a 2007 Subaru Forester that I paid cash for. I will drive that until it dies. We have a we have a decent house. Um, it's three acres of land here in, in central Reno. We've got a little farm. We raise some animals. We have a 2,000 square foot house that we remodeled. It, it, it looks pretty darn nice, but it's not huge. But what I learned out of that that has saved me time and money and and effort so, so the maximum return on investment is being crystal clear about the shit that i need and that i don't need because i value my time i've got two girls that i want to be a significant part of their life i love brazilian jiu-jitsu i love snorkeling i like experiential type stuff so i'm really cl crystal clear about the the gear that is going to facilitate my life versus the things that are kind of pandering to my ego and but are really, really costly. And it was watching our clients who basically lost everything because they were keeping up with the Joneses. That was the most valuable lesson that I've ever had. That's an awesome answer, Rob. Man. I really appreciate that. Oh, thanks. Thank you. It was a great question. You, you I, honestly, <laughs> I've been doing a, a ton of podcasts, and this has been really enjoyable because we really got to go outside of just the protein, carbs, fat, wired to eat deal and uh, <laughs> uh, get into some other stuff. You, you do a really good podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Rob. No, it's good to hear. It's good to hear. Um, I just, yeah, I don't want to, uh, you know, beat the same drum over and over and over. I want to create something original for people to. Um, what's the the best way? I mean, most people know how to find you, but what what is the uh, the best way for people to contact you and find out more about what you're up to? Uh, RobWolf.com is where it all happens. Uh, two B's and the Rob. Uh, the Wired to Eat again is released in the U.S. March 21st, I believe, in the U.K. March 8th. Um, we have some pre-order bonuses for folks um if you go to robwolf.com forward slash wired to eat there's some really cool stuff that you can pull down on that but all of the bonuses go away as of march 21st um the uk folks you could still take advantage of that up until the 21st awesome make sure that's featured in the show notes so for everyone listening if you like this episode please do subscribe send it to a friend to listen and then leave a review on itunes which helps me a tremendous amount to find this episode and the show notes and all of our episodes go to 15 minute one five minute corporate warrior.com forward slash podcasts you can follow me on twitter at lawrence m for mike neil n-e-a-l and search corporate warrior on facebook rob thanks again for joining me and taking the time out of your day i really appreciate it and i think this has been an excellent conversation so i'm looking forward to getting it live and we'll obviously let you know as soon as it's uh, available to to share in the on the internet fantastic thanks awesome. for doing this and again the really nice nice job this was a very enjoyable podcast thank you you're welcome rob i appreciate the feedback all the best take care cheers bye
This podcast is brought to you by hituni.com. HitUni are a provider of amazing online courses for high intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carson, and trainer Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer Simon Shawcross. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, and Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing and the courses are really easy to follow and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention that there is a DIY course. So this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regimen. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I.com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, that's hituni.com, pick your course, and enter the coupon code CW10. Thank you for your support.